Good morning. Good morning. The first reading is from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Salah, that your way may be known upon earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God, let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Salah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us that all the ends of the earth revere him. Welcome to worship, and I invite you to pass the red friendship pad uh, back and forth on your row. And I want to mention just a few uh, announcements this morning. Uh, first, I want to um, thank our Sunday school teachers. Uh, this is uh, Teacher Recognition Day, and they're listed in your bulletin, but if you have been a teacher for an adult class or a children's class or a youth class or 
or whatever um, educational opportunities are here at Trinity right now, would you please stand to be recognized? Thank you so much. Um, want to um, also mention that next week we begin our summer worship schedule, uh, which will be from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day, uh, 10 o'clock, one service, and we're using the sanctuary, and there are certain services that are going to be held outside, so you pay attention as you receive the email each week to know whether we're outside or inside, but um, we, we will be gathering at 10 o'clock. Um, I'm going to be saying more about uh, a special outside worship service on June the 5th in my sermon, so I'm not going to say a lot about it right now. Just know that we want you to have that date on your calendar and plan to be here for that um, June the 5th worship. And, and June the 12th is our picnic Sunday. Because we are doing box lunches this year, we do need you to sign up and let us know you're coming so we know how many box lunches uh, to prepare. So um, just find that link, and if you uh, need to call the church office instead, call the church office. Let them know you're coming and how many lunches uh, we will need for your family. We are also, for that day, uh, seeking the names of graduates. And we're not just talking about high school graduates, also college graduates. And if folks have finished an additional degree program beyond um, college, let us know. We want to recognize all our graduates uh, on that Sunday. Uh, there's a men's fellowship event uh, in your bulletin, so pay attention to that. Uh, sign up for Lemonade on the Lawn. Uh, if your small group or musical group or whatever has not signed up for a Lemonade on the Lawn, uh, go look at that schedule and sign up uh, to help us uh, with our summer uh, work gatherings. I also want to mention an announcement that is not in your bulletin. Let me find that. Here it is. So um, Max Furig, who is Tecla's nephew, stand up, let us see you, yay, is completing uh, his uh, Eagle Scout, uh, and so he is doing a project uh, out in the Northex. Already, I saw this morning, there is a box for laundry supplies. Uh, they are looking for detergent, dryer sheets, fabric softener, and laundry baskets. Uh, and these are going to be given to newly housed folks through where, Bridges to Independence. Uh, so please help Max with his um, Eagle Scout project by dropping those supplies off sometime during this week and putting them uh, in or near that box. Uh, and we'll know that that's for it. Thank you so much for being here today. We have a moment for mission. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Chloe, and I'm here on behalf of MSM to uh, tell you about the Pentecost offering this year. Um, it's one of four offerings that the PCUSA uh, collects each year, um, and the Pentecost offering specifically goes to helping children and youth at risk. Um, so the Presbyterian Mission Agency uses 60% of the offering, um, and Trinity gets to use 40% for an organization of our choice. And so this year, MSM decided we'll give our uh, portion to the UNICEF Children and Youth Fund in Ukraine. Um, so this fund is actively working to meet the needs of Ukrainian children and families by delivering family hygiene kits, working to provide safe drinking water, and distributing temporary education supplies for children who cannot go to school. They also have mobile care facilities that include mental health support for children. Um, the offering will be collected on June 5th. Thank you. <laughs> Will you join me in the prayer of approach? Oh God, unravel within us any urge to assert power over another. Awaken us to our connection, the vulnerability and wonder of being a creature on a planet, in a solar system, in this corner of the cosmos. 
enliven within us a curiosity about the ways of gentleness and mutuality. Ancient God of becoming, guide us towards connecting love this day and each day. Amen. So thank you for coming down. And I want to uh, tell you a story this morning. You might have already heard this story. It's about a woman named Lydia. Did you hear this story already? It's okay then. This is a story about a woman named Lydia and the time she met a man named Paul. Okay? Sometimes we find good things in unexpected places. When we listen to God, we should be ready to be surprised like that. So there are really good things that happen in this story. Paul and his friends traveled from city to city to tell people the good news about Jesus. One of the first cities they went to was Philippi, a city ruled by the Romans. Paul found that not many Jews lived in Philippi, so there was no synagogue. Where do people go to worship, he wondered. Worshippers of God gathered to pray on the riverbank outside the city. Some women were praying there when Paul and his friends arrived. Paul sat down to talk with the women. One of the women was named Lydia. She sold purple cloth. Now who used purple cloth? Do you guys know? Like kings, royalty, very wealthy people because purple cloth was really expensive. So only really powerful and wealthy people could use purple cloth. So she sold purple cloth to people. And Lydia was curious about what Paul was teaching. So she wanted to know more about Jesus. She heard the good news from Paul, and she got very excited. She asked Paul 
would you come to my house and baptize me and everyone who lives at my house? Paul did go to her house and baptize them all. Then Lydia said, you don't know very many people here. Now you know me, and I'm a believer in Jesus. Come stay at my house. Paul and his friends stayed with Lydia for a long time, as long as they were in Philippi. They were able to tell many more people about Jesus and how God wanted them to treat other people. And I love that story because sometimes we meet people and we think, wow, that was a God moment. God brought us together, and that's how Paul and Lydia felt about meeting that day down by the river. And Lydia became a leader, and she became a leader simply by using a gift that she had, and that gift was welcoming new people. When she came, was down at the river that day, and Paul and his friends came, she didn't know them. But she was interested in them, interested in what they had to say, and so she welcomed them, and lots of people got to hear what they wanted to say because Lydia welcomed them. Then after that, her house became an open house. People would come there to learn about Jesus. They would come to that house. So Lydia became a leader just because she had this gift of love and hospitality in her heart. And she opened up her home. And that house became a house church. Well, it's a place, it's, you know, sometimes when people start a church, they have a very small number of people and they start out meeting in a house. And that's what it was. They started out meeting in Lydia's house until they got big enough to become a, a church that met somewhere else. But they started right there in her own house. That's what a house church is. And people still do that today. Uh, my husband's church, Emmanuel, a Presbyterian church in McLean, they started out in a house. And that house is still there next to their sanctuary. So you can still see the house they started out in. So how about that? Yeah, it's a good story. So uh, I have bookmarks this morning. Uh, God has poured out his love into our hearts. So take one of those and and color it and use it in one of your books or in your Bible uh, to remind you that God has poured gifts of love and hospitality and all kinds of other gifts uh, into us. Thank you for coming up. Thank you. The uh, two next readings um, are from, from John and from Acts. John 14, verses 23 to 29. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it's from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. Now from Acts 16, chapter 16, verses nine through 15. This will sound very familiar. 
During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man in Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When Paul had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God, that God had called us to proclaim the news to him. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was sitting listening to us. She was from the city of Theatria and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. And may the gospel be more to us than mere words. May the Holy Spirit produce in us strong conviction. Amen. The book of Acts tells the story of how the ministry Jesus started was continued by the disciples he left behind. As those original followers shared stories about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, more people came to believe. More leaders joined the movement, and these apostles began to spread out into the surrounding regions, taking their message to new places and to new people. This continued and expanded ministry in the world was something Jesus had been preparing them to do the entire time they were with him. He had showed them how to nurture each other in ministry through the strong community they maintained with each other. He had sent them out on missions without him so they would trust their own God-given gifts, their own instincts and abilities. An important part of the verbal instruction Jesus gave them before these missions was how to receive the hospitality of a community. Everything from a place to stay to food and a receptive audience. He also taught them how to know when it was time to move on. And he promised them that they would not be alone, but that the Holy Spirit would guide them, give them the words they needed, point them toward the places they needed to go. The writer of Acts makes it clear that the Holy Spirit was in the driver's seat from the get-go, but their reliance on the Spirit's guidance becomes even more clear at certain points in the story. At the beginning of chapter 16, Paul and the apostles with whom he was traveling had made a plan. Let's go to Asia, they said. I can see them now, filled with a sense of adventure and all ready to storm that region with word about Jesus. But the Spirit said no. That's all the scripture tells us, that the Holy Spirit prevented them from doing that. So instead, they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. And when they got to a certain place, they said, hey, we're near Bithynia, let's go over there. Surely we're not meant to be this close and not go over there. But again, the Holy Spirit said no. So listening to the Holy Spirit, they traveled yet another way, a way that led them down to Troas, to the edge of the Aegean Sea. That's where today's text picks up, with the apostles wondering, what now? If not this, then what? 
It's not here, then where? It's not now, then when? Where will the Spirit lead us next? We know this situation well. At least those of us who have been prevented from going to a college we thought for sure we were destined to attend. Those of us who have come to the end of a relationship with someone we were sure was the one. We know the situation well, at least those of us who already had furniture picked out for a house that went to another buyer. Those of us who didn't get the job we were sure would be our next career move. When have you had to rethink your plans because you were prevented from doing the thing you had in your heart and mind? When the apostles let go of their own plans, that's when Paul had a dream. In the night, he had a vision of a man from Macedonia calling over the waters of the Aegean Sea, come over here and help us. So they got up the next morning and immediately set sail, crossing into Europe. They hopped from city to city once they got to the other side and finally found themselves in Philippi. On the Sabbath day, they wandered down to the river hoping to find some worshipers there. It was a well-known tradition for people to gather close to water to pray when there were not enough Jewish men to form a synagogue. Paul and his companions went down by the river at the edge of Philippi and found a gathering of women who were praying and worshiping God. Among them was a woman who stood out. Like Tabitha, who the apostles had encountered earlier, Lydia was a tradeswoman. She sold purple cloth, expensive fabric used by the wealthy and powerful. Lydia is also identified as a God-fearer, a term that referred to synagogue worshipers who were not Jewish. Paul struck up a conversation with her, one that be would be remembered as a God moment when the Holy Spirit had a hand in the meeting of these two minds. When Paul and his companions began to speak, Lydia listened intently, moved herself closer to these new teachers as God opened her heart to all they were saying. Before long, she asked to be baptized, asked that everyone in her household be baptized. She has been called the first convert in Europe. I love how the Spirit works in this story. Clearly, the Holy Spirit has already been at work in Lydia before the apostles arrive, preparing her. So when she hears the gospel and becomes a Jesus follower, she goes all in, immediately jumping into active faith, immediately offering the hospitality of her home. What happens in this story is that Paul and the other apostles with him learn that ministry is not just something we are called to do for others. The good news is not something we are called to impart to others. Ministry has a mutuality to it. Ministry is life-giving work we are called to do with others. What Paul learned about Lydia, beyond the fact that she was a God-fearer, beyond the fact that she was a dealer of purple cloth, was that she was a natural leader with a gift for hospitality. Lydia is so moved by hearing the good news about Jesus that she doesn't just invite, she insists that the apostles come to her home to stay. When they hesitate, she prevails upon them until they say yes. Similar acts of hospitality are how the early church spread. Small groups of followers came together in house churches, which in some places led to the formation of larger groups or congregations. One of the places where a larger congregation formed was in Philippi, where Lydia's hospitality was the basis for a growing community. It is amazing what God can do with a small act of hospitality. I have shared from this pulpit many times how gifts of hospitality have been shared by members of this community. 
how people have opened their homes and hearts to people they did not know, and how blessed they were by this profound act of caring. How one family made room for a young mother who had just immigrated from Kenya with her young son. How another family took in a Middle Eastern student who showed up here one Sunday looking for housing while she completed a master's degree. How we all got to know a young man from China because he was here as an exchange student for a year. These and other stories of people who have found a second family here among the members of this congregation remind me that the kind of hospitality Lydia exhibited is still at work in the world today and still connecting us with people all over the world who have experienced the love of God here in some season of their lives. Jesus always knew that hospitality was at the very heart of what it meant to be faithful to God. Jesus' ministry centered around table fellowship and the hospitality of friends and strangers. Those who stood on the side watching him couldn't believe he ate with tax collectors and sinners. But he ate with Pharisees too. He went to weddings, he stayed with friends, and he accepted the invitation to stay with strangers. And in that way, he made more and more friends for God. People who wanted to walk in the way that leads to God. On the night of his arrest, Jesus gathered his disciples for a final meal. And he said to them, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. And on the day of his resurrection, he appeared to them on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize him as they walked along, but when they stopped for the night, they invited him to stay with them, prevailed upon him, insisted. And when he sat down at table with them and broke the bread, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. It's amazing what God can do with a small act of hospitality. When have you been part of God's work in the world through acts of hospitality? Have you given someone the word of encouragement they needed? Have you listened, really listened, with no urge to break in with your own thoughts, but the pure desire to allow someone else to share a burden or pain they are carrying? Have you stopped to see about a stranger in distress, welcomed a newcomer to your school, your workplace, your church community? Or are you the one who has been grabbed up in someone else's welcoming hug that gave you a taste of the kingdom of God? Did someone mentor you as a young person, help you find your path in life? Did someone introduce you to another person who became your spouse or your important faith friend? Has someone walked alongside you during a particular time of crisis? Has someone taken you into their home or their heart when you had nowhere else to go. Godly hospitality is all over this story of when Paul meets Lydia and the other women who had gone down to the river to pray. It is important to note that the first act of hospitality in this story is the apostles remarkable openness to the direction of the Holy Spirit. They try to figure out their own next step and are prevented. But when they finally stop and wait for the Spirit's guidance, they are not disappointed. This episode serves to remind us church people, especially leaders, that God is in charge of the mission. We who are leaders often find it difficult to wait patiently through discernment processes that can be frustrating and difficult. We prefer to read the latest book and go in that direction or look at the booming congregation across town and try to emulate that. This story tells us that sometimes it is a matter of waiting for the still small voice to show us our next move. One of the most important acts of hospitality we all need to engage in is making room for the Holy Spirit in our decisions, individual decisions, family decisions, and decisions as the body of Christ on the corner of Inglewood and 16th Street. We are in an Acts 16 moment in the life of our church, as are many churches navigating the move to a new normal after two and a half years of intense change due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Safety protocols prevented us from doing many of the things we usually do or doing them in the way we usually do them. We have been in waiting mode ever since, asking the question, what now? What do people have energy for now? What are the most important things we need to be doing now? God has gotten us through this time of upheaval, but where will the Spirit lead us next? On Sunday, June 5th, we will celebrate Pentecost Sunday and will int intentionally engage the question, what now as a congregation? This will be an intergenerational time of reflection on what brings us the most life, the most joy at church. We will ask together and in small groups led by members of the session, what it is that draws us to deeper connection with God and with our neighbors, what inspires us to deeper faith, what prepares us to go from this place more grounded, more centered, more able to see and follow Christ in our daily living. As congregation members and leaders, this is the primary act of hospitality, openness to listen to one another, and to the Holy Spirit for direction. The book of Acts shows us just how much can happen when we take the time to listen in this way. I hope you will come and participate on June 5th, even if you're not sure this kind of process will be comfortable for you. Help us make room for the Holy Spirit in our discernment through your holy listening, your shared experiences. And in your daily living, I invite you to walk this Jesus way, a way of open arms, of wide open hearts, of open doors and reckless hospitality. People's lives really are changed by such acts and the kingdom of God draws near. It is amazing what God can do with a little bit of hospitality. Amen.
as we come to the time of prayer, uh, I refer you to the thoughts and prayers page that was on the email you received from Trinity this morning or in the printed bulletin that you have. Uh, we are uh, continuing uh, to rejoice with Elizabeth and Martin on the birth of their new granddaughter, Iona. And uh, we extend uh, congratulations to John and to Sarah uh, on, their, uh, grad on their upcoming graduations uh, submitted by proud Aunt Marilyn. Uh, and also want to um, be in prayer for a family friend of the Foley's uh, who is hospitalized uh, from injuries from domestic abuse. And also want to remember um, the Native Americans who, as children, uh, survived the abuse that happened in U.S. residential boarding schools. Uh, just as that history came out in Canada, uh, we knew that that would be opening up the questions about the schools that were run here in the United States, and it uh, absolutely has led to that. And so uh, as those stories are coming more to light, uh, there is generational trauma that people are dealing with, and uh, so we, are, we pray uh, about that. There are other names on our prayer list. Some have been there for um, a long time in our prayers, people who are in long-term illnesses or who in are in treatment. And I ask that you take time uh, to read those and to continue to be in prayer for folks. We also are aware that there are many in our community right now who are affected by COVID-19 again, as it is uh, again, having quite a bit of community spread, and some of that is anecdotal because each one of us knows some folks who have been exposed or who have uh, COVID-19 right now. So continue to pray uh, about that. Let us pray. Loving God, you gave to John of Patmos a wonderful vision of a river of life. We pray today for that image to come to reality throughout our world. We know that there are many who are thirsty, who live in places of drought, who travel far to get one container of clean water, who do not have the luxury that we take for granted of turning on a tap and having fresh water gush out. May the world find ways to provide fresh, clean water to those who are thirsty. We know that many are thirsty for hope, longing for the day when a life-giving river might flow to their door and not simply pass them by. Bring rivers of hope, of truth, of light, gushing into places of dryness in our world. We know that there are those for whom rivers are frightening and harmful. Bring relief to those who are plagued with floods or who are overwhelmed by a crazy life that washes over them and carries them away. Help us, loving God, to see every river, every stream, every lake, every precious drop of water as a symbol of your commitment to life and hope. May we savor the goodness of the waters of life and find new and exciting ways to share them with a thirsty world. Hear our prayers now for those we know who are sick or who suffer in any way. We lift all these prayers in the name and spirit of Jesus using the words he taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to a moment of worship when we consider our stewardship, and particularly our stewardship to Trinity Presbyterian Church. Uh, as always, uh, we are grateful for the 
uh, strong support that you continue to give to this community of faith and to the ministry and mission of this church. Uh, and there are many ways to respond, and they are here listed in the bulletin. Um, and also, please remember uh, that special offering that will be coming up on June 5th. Um, and I'm so grateful for the moment for mission alerting us uh, to, that that is coming. Thank you. have a basket at the back of church as you leave and this prayer of dedication is for all the many ways that you have responded uh, with offerings to the church will you pray with me spirit of god alive in all creation may our gifts of money and wise action flow unfettered to where they are needed may we dance open-heartedly with the ebb and flow of giving and receiving for our thriving is intertwined. Amen.
Jennifer has previously been ordained as an elder, and so she is being installed uh, as an elder at this time on the session uh, in this service. We begin with an affirmation of baptismal vows, and that is not only for incoming uh, elders, but for everyone. So will you uh, join me in that? Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, say, I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciples, showing his, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, say, I will with God's help. And so I ask these questions now. Uh, of you, Jennifer. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, and acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal, and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you and will you? I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? Will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? These questions uh, to the congregation. Do we, the members of the church, accept Jennifer as a ruling elder chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do you? Do. do we agree to pray for her, to encourage her, to respect her decisions, and to follow as she guides us, uh, along with uh, the others who were uh, ordained, serving Jesus Christ who alone is head of the church? Do you? Do. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, by water and the Spirit, you claimed us as your own, cleansed us from sin, and gave us new life. You made us members of your body, the Church, calling us to be your servants in the world. Uphold these elders and daily increase in them their gifts for ministry. Send them forth in the power of your Spirit to love and serve you with joy and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. May we show them joy and thanksgiving as we welcome them into leadership of this church to share with us in the ministry of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Jennifer, you are now installed as a ruling elder chosen to serve this congregation on this particular term uh, and session. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I also want to ask if you are going off the session now at the end of your three-year term, would you stand to be recognized? We are so grateful for your leadership. I want to just, you know, briefly say that this is the first group of elders who said yes to being an elder, not knowing 
that we were going to be facing a pandemic, and they have led us very well through that. So I'm very appreciative for that. Thank you. Would you stand for the benediction? May the love of life fill our hearts. May the love of earth bring joy to heaven. May the love of self deepen our souls. May the love of neighbor heal our world. As nations, as peoples, as families this day, may the love of life heal our world. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.